Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, your host for tonight's conversation. One of our guests joining me at the pub tonight is Dr. Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. Mike, welcome to The Real Science Exchange. This is your first time here, but you've previously shared your insights on The Real Science webinar series talking about dairy profitability. So tell us, how's 2021 shaping up? And please tell me it's going to be better than the roller coaster ride we've been on in 2020. Well, well Scott, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I, I think uh, I see it as a glass half full or half empty. I think it's half full uh, because we're getting uh, a fairly mild winter and fairly good milk production at this point. And at right now, uh, fairly favorable milk prices. Uh, half empty, uh, we're going to have to export 3% more milk. And that's a lot of milk that we have to export at this point. And we're seeing that corn and soybean prices going up. So it's going to be a challenging year, a little differently than 2020. Very well. Sounds like it's going to be a lively conversation as we look into our crystal ball. Now, before we get too far into the discussions here, Mike, uh, first tell us what's in your glass tonight and, and tell us about uh, the guest that you've brought with you. Yeah, well, what I've got here tonight is a true Wisconsin drink. It's called a shot. <laughs> and, and a chaser, which would be a, would be a beer as far as that goes. And, and your shot can be of any kind you really want to participate in. So that's very common in Wisconsin, a shot and a beer. And uh, when it gets pretty cold, that's not a bad, bad combination. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, my one of our, our, our top dairymen here in the state of Illinois, and that's Scott Brenner up at Pearl City. And uh, he's got a very interesting history in terms of how he connects all the dots. And I think your listeners are going to find this pretty interesting as well. So I'll turn it back to uh, either one of the two Scots at this point, and we'll go from there. All right, great. Scott, I see that Stephanie has delivered your drink order, and I understand there might be a story that goes along with that. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, th thanks, Scott, for having me on. Uh, when Stephanie contacted me about uh, drink of choice, I said, well, even though I'm from Illinois, I prefer the a Wisconsin brandy old fashioned. And uh, she said, well, what kind of brandy would you like? I said, well, I'm a cheap dairy farmer, so I'll drink, uh, you know, Christian Brothers, Corbell, you know, the, the standards. And uh, I left it at that. And she uh, messaged me back a couple hours later and said, uh, uh, it didn't feel right to, uh, shipping you a bottle and paying more for shipping than what the bottle costs. So I ordered you a little more expensive bottle. So, <laughs> so to, uh, this afternoon I'm uh, enjoying uh, a Hennessy brandy old fashioned. So uh, looking forward to some good discussion. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of introduce Steph. Steph, uh, Steph's one of our talented marketing uh, team members, but she also moonlights as the bartender for the Real Science Exchange. Uh, you know, we, we joke that this is a virtual podcast, but the drinks are not virtual. And so she actually takes orders from our participants and delivers them to them prior to the podcast. So, uh, Stephanie, thank you for, uh, for that. And th thank you for uh, taking uh, good care of us. Uh, Clay, I didn't mean to leave you sitting there silently all alone. So uh, uh, tell us tonight, how, how's your hard cider tonight? It, it's quite good and cold <laughs> to, to, to go <laughs> with the weather that, outside. The, still in that rut, I guessed. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Now, you know, Clay, you always forget. Uh, you need to do a better job reading your script. You always forget to ask me what I'm drinking. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. So now I usually – I. I uh, wander the cheap aisles, and so I, I picked up something called uh, FEW bourbon. Um, it's not bad. It's it it is from the cheap aisle, but um, it's just a bit sweet. So so that that's what I'm uh, enjoying tonight. So cheers to everybody on the call tonight. Appreciate you being here. Um, with yeah, with that, let's get started. Uh, Mike, we talked to you back in July, right in the midst of the COVID nineteen pandemic. How have things changed since then? Well, uh, the things that changed is fairly strong milk prices. That's the good news. From uh, We had some pretty tough prices back there in uh, March and April as far as that goes. It also appears that our milk reduction program has slowed down. 
uh, and they weren't required to uh, reduce milk production by 5, 10, 15, or even up to 20, 20% 20 as far as that goes. So milk, So when things happen like that with a really mild early winter and fall, lots and lots of milk. Even the state of Illinois is up about 2.5%, which is almost what the national average is. So uh, we're, we're getting a lot of milk, and that opens up another whole set of questions on export and, and, and the weak dollar. That should be a plus. But again, uh, COVID is still here, and we're fighting it pretty hard here in Illinois. And uh, the shots are coming out. Uh, we're, I think the state now has got 1.5% uh, uh, of the population completed, but uh, that's a long ways from the, the, the herd immunity number. Yeah. So part of our bumpy ride last year had to do with supply chain issues. Have, have we got all that ironed out? And do you see that changing as we start opening up the economy? Well, I, I think uh, I, I see that our, our processors got a lot more flexible. In other words, they could react pretty quickly. So when schools stopped buying half pints of milk, they said, we've got to put this in some other format as far as that goes and uh, and get it into the uh, stores. Because uh, I did not see it in my stores here in central Illinois, but there were stores that were out of milk. They, they didn't have any milk. And because people were just buying all this milk and, 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 and for home consumption as far as that goes. And so I, I think that uh, we, we've seen the processors develop more flexibility, how they're going to balance uh, what they're going to be making and where they're going to try to market their, their products as far as that goes. The, the sad news is that our restaurants still aren't open full-fledged here in Illinois. We just opened ours up here, and we've got different regions of Illinois that they can go to 25% capacity or 25 people. And, and so obviously that's a great resource for uh, butter and sour cream and cheeses, and yet those are really slowed down. Yeah. Hey, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that uh, you experienced last year? And then what does your uh, uh, crystal ball look like looking into 21 or 2021? Well, like like Mike mentioned, uh, the unexpected price volatility probably <clears throat> impacted us as much as anything. Uh, you, you know, you sit down end of the year, this time of the year and work through a budget and and put some numbers together and you think you've got a pretty pretty good plan put in place and and uh, something like uh, this pandemic comes along and all of a sudden uh, you're eight nine ten dollars a hundred off of where your budget lines were and um, that that makes things pretty challenging in a hurry and uh, when it's one one month why you weather through that and, and regroup but uh, with the way this thing is drug on, we, you know, we faced it from, you know, middle of the spring through all the summer and into fall before things really started coming back. And so, uh, so yeah, so that was probably the biggest challenge for us. We've, we've always been pretty proactive in trying to lock as many costs in as we, we can, uh, especially from the feed side of things. So uh, that's obviously helping us right now with what price feed prices are doing. But at the same time, we had some pretty favorable numbers locked in for last year. And so it didn't uh, didn't hurt quite as bad as maybe maybe it did for other folks uh, who maybe didn't have some commodities locked in. But um, we were we were probably one of the more fortunate ones. Uh, we saw some some nasty PPDs, but I've got some neighbors not far from us that happened to be in a different pool that saw two and three times uh, negative than what we were. So uh, we were we were very fortunate that, that we did not have to do anything from a, a production decrease um, standpoint or uh, face the, you know, I, the one fellow down the road from us, I think he had a, like an 1175 uh, the one month and we ended up at like a 450. So, so yeah, it's, uh, and so, you know, most of that's obviously all of it's all out of your control, depending on what your market is. So, um, so yeah, that was that was definitely probably the biggest challenges that that we have faced through this whole thing. Scott, I was wondering if you could give us a little background on your dairy operation and and your your whole background in the dairy industry. Sure, sure, uh, be glad to. Uh, as Mike said, we've kind of got a unique story up here at the farm myself personally i grew up on a on a small dairy farm have basically been around cows my entire life and it's just the passion that i have and and 
had an opportunity 20 plus years ago to get involved with a, a very successful dairy. Uh, after our family, due to some health issues with my father, uh, dispersed our family operation, but it gave me an opportunity to, to, to stay in the dairy industry. And uh, uh, three years ago, uh, myself and or my family and, and another partner were able to uh, start a purchase process uh, of purchasing Hunter Haven Farms. And so we're three years in, three years and a month into uh, a purchase of that, of that dairy. And um, in 1997, I was involved with the expansion of the dairy. Uh, we went from 80 cows to 450 and, and today we're, we're milking uh, right around 950 cows. And so over that 20 plus years time, we've, we've just kind of grown gradually and, and uh, tried to adapt to what's happening around the world and, and try to stay as profitable as we can. And it, and it gave, it gave myself and, and my partner the opportunity to, to do what we're doing today. So um, obviously took a lot of planning. We spent probably three plus years putting all the pieces together. It's a, it's a big, a big thing to wrap your brain around, but uh, uh, Doug and Tom knew that they wanted the dairy to continue. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm very grateful that they trusted myself and, and Nate to take over uh, the responsibilities of the dairy. And so it's, it's given us a, an opportunity to, to move forward and hopefully have a, a good foothold for the future for, for the rest of, of my career. And hopefully if my children decide to do the same, why well, to give them the same opportunity? So, yeah. So you said you're at 950 cows right now. What's your plans for the future and where do you see that sweet spot? And is that sweet spot going to change uh, as you look uh, forward? Well, uh, we we do have some things planned for the spring, uh, more of an update situation than really doing any kind of expansion, try to improve cow comfort, uh, uh, add some ventilation, things like that to the facility. Uh, with the way we, the way we're structured, uh, with our milking parlor and, and manure, uh, storage capacity, that 950 to a thousand cows is, is kind of where we're going to, we're going to be at, um, short of moving and, and building a new facility. Uh, so we've, we've kind of tried to focus on, on cow comfort and efficiency production on the, on the dairy herd. Obviously that's, that's, uh, where the the dollars come from to make the thing flow. And so we've, we've kind of, uh, refocused, I guess you might say on, on that and have looked at some of the, maybe the enter other enterprises that we had been running in the dairy and, and either eliminated them, or uh, I guess you could say subbed them out to uh, other contractors. And so, uh, by doing so, it's, it did allow us to control some costs, set some things that uh, uh, we were had some uh, variation on, but it also allowed us to to take the team of people that I had and focus on the cows. And for us, that's kind of kind of where we've we've been able to make the most improvements. I think with what we've done in the last couple of years. So, Mike, during the during the webinar, you you talked about milk components and, you know, the impact that that has on profitability. Um, you want to expand on that some? And, and then I, I, I'm curious what Scott's been doing along those lines as well. Sure. I, I can kick it off and Scott, then you can, you can correct me <laughs> or straighten me out. Anyway, uh, a lot of interesting components, uh, uh, 80 some percent of the milk, Scott, I'm, I don't think you're caught in that. We're under a quota system, much like the Canadian quota. So our farmers quickly discovered that one way to build your milk check was to increase the fat and protein content and maintain the same volume of milk. So that incentive came into play. Right now, I think milk's a little more than uh, milk proteins, a little more than three dollars a pound. At one time, a couple months ago, five dollars a pound, and that'll get your attention pretty quickly as far as that goes. Milk fat uh, used to be three dollars a pound. Now it's down around a buck, uh, about around a buck and a half. So, so we read those tea leaves there, and simply saying, uh, Illinois is a component-based milk market compared, like like Wisconsin, unlike Florida or Georgia, and so we are looking at pounds of solids, and of course, protein. You know, today, and I think in the next number of years, milk protein is going to drive the ship 
because people want high quality animal protein. That could be cheese, that can be milk, that can be pork, that can be chicken, that can be beef, whatever, wherever we want to go. And so uh, we, we just think there's some, most dairy farms, uh, maybe your people have not seen the data, but we looked at the first 100 days after calving on uh, some 4,000 herds processed in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. And milk protein is, is low, really low. And so these cows are talking to us and say, hey, send me some amino acids. If you want to get a, a 3-1 protein, we're talking in the first 100 days, a lot of these groups, and these are high producing groups with 30,000 pounds of milk, sitting with a 2-9 protein test. And Holstein should be around 3-1. So Scott, I'm not sure where your herd is sitting, but the point is, boy, if you can get another 2 tenths protein, and you're and, and, and we've got some herds in Wisconsin, here in Illinois and Wisconsin at 100 pounds a day, you know, that's, 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 uh, that's a lot of protein. So I'll stop yeah. there and say it's exciting times here. And Scott, what's, what's, what's happening on your farm? Well, that's, that's definitely, uh, fortunately you're right, Mike, we, we haven't had to deal with the quota, uh, systems that some of the other producers in the state have, but that said, one of the goals that, that we set out uh, three years ago when we did the purchase, uh, was that we, we wanted to push, uh, pounds of fat and protein out the, our, out the farm gate. Uh, we were, we were at a meeting uh, up in Minnesota, and uh, one of the speakers at that conference said, "Your your goal should be seven pounds of combined fat and protein." And uh, I didn't even know what our number was at the time when we went to the meeting, but obviously came home very quickly and did the math, and uh, uh, we were we were under six at that time. And um, so it's been our mission to get to seven pounds. Now, obviously, there's lots of different ways you can go about that, but um, we, uh, about four months ago, started pushing some, some uh, rumen protected uh, aminos at the cows. Uh, I did the math this morning before uh, I came to get on to the podcast here, and, and we're just under seven pounds today. A 6.92 is what my numbers did for us. And so we've moved the, we've moved the needle significantly in the last couple of years, and, and uh We've did that multiple ways. We've we've improved uh, production, but also have moved the protein level uh, two tenths. Actually, like you referred to, Mike, that uh, that uh, really has impacted it. And uh, you got to be careful. Uh, you can you can push numbers and and uh, make sure that uh, are you are you, at the end of the day are you still making money? Because um, obviously, amino acids are not cheap to feed. Um, you can add, you know, 30, 40 cents per head per day pretty quickly. Uh, and if you don't get a response out of that, you're actually going backwards. So I guess all I would say to that side is, you know, know what your costs are to do that change and then be sure you can measure it and know, uh, are, are we paying for the extra protein that we're putting in the cow or are we just making our numbers look good? So, so, uh, so yeah, when I did the math on it, uh, Based off of last month's milk check, we were at a, at twelve cents of of additional income, even though that that uh, additional feed was you know in that high thirty range. So so uh, so yeah, it it's something that definitely can can affect the bottom line. So in addition to maybe fatty acid or uh, amino acids. What other kind of interventions have you been looking at? You know, some of the things that our, our, our tech people talk about is, is maximizing uh, microbial protein, right? There's a great source of a very high quality amino acids. Just curious if, if, if you're doing anything along those lines. We really haven't changed a whole lot else in the, in the diet. We've, we've historically always had some uh, uh, blood meal in, in the diet. So we've, we've had a little bit in the ration all along. We do feed some microbials. Uh, but really, again, trying to focus on high quality forage uh, and then and clean forage, I guess, too. That's the other part of the equation. A year ago, we thought we had some pretty good corn silage and uh, excuse me, two years ago, it would have, would have been 18's corn silage. Uh, ended up having a, quite a bit of uh a toxin issue with it and so you had a lot of tons but you also had some some issues with it so uh, you got to be careful and paying attention to that too because if you're dealing with molds and yeast and and you can have the ration perfect but uh those those critters are 
are messing everything up and the cow can't utilize what you're trying to put in front of her. So I, I would just add to that. Are we just arguing you got to have the metabolizable protein value as a dairy farmer. If you are not calculating metabolizable protein, wow, you are really making some huge assumptions and or mistakes as far as that goes. So I know there's a number of programs here in the U S and Europe that look that do a nice job on that. But if you aren't doing that, that's a take home message from our, 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 our uh, pubcast here today. And that is uh, make sure you, you get that checked out because with this, you know, with soybean meal getting maybe approaching 430 bucks a ton, uh, people are going to start asking about women protected uh, urea and raw urea and should i use it and the answer is yes maybe you maybe you can but that metabolizable protein program will tell you immediately uh, if you should be doing that yep that's a great point mike and uh of course your soybean meal values your prices are lower than a lot of the other parts of the country so that that'd be a bargain <laughs> some other yeah and, and and the sad part is the the word the word on the street is it's going to go higher because china is buying huge amounts of soybeans it's not raining in uh it just started raining in brazil and argentina so they think that could be a lighter crop as far as that goes and and, and so uh wow and, and and the same thing with corn china is buying a boatload literally boatloads of corn so hang on to your hats you know i'm not sure with these higher prices what the ethanol plants will do with corn but uh good luck scott uh i'm glad to hear you, you locked in some prices because uh, you could have locked in soybean meal in, in the midwest under three hundred dollars a ton back there in midsummer and here we are you know for 440 430 and and then higher and uh, you folks out east you get to a uh, trucker in here from the midwest so you're you, it's going to be higher right. and, and that's where we were at mike you know we we booked a lot of that last summer and fall and so i think our year average i think we're at like 307 for the for this coming <laughs> year so um and we try to routinely do that. Now, I'm not sure we're going to have that opportunity this summer, but uh, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So, but yeah, I, I, we've always been of the philosophy that if you can lock your feed costs in and you know that it's a profitable level, you better do it. Um, and right now is a perfect example of why why you should do that. So. Scott, you you prompted me a little bit. What what are you doing on forage harvesting? Do you have your own crew, your own equipment? Are you farm that out? And what about heifers? What are you doing in those two major enterprises? Sure. Um, yes, we're we have our own chopping uh, program. I guess you'd say we we bought a chopper. I don't know four or five six years ago now. I used machine. I actually bought it from the custom operator that had been coming to the dairy. They were looking to downsize their their custom operation and so we had an opportunity to uh, purchase that chopper obviously knew the history of the chopper because it had been on our farm for several years and so that's how we kind of dipped into it and uh, I've really felt that we've been able to take a little bit better ownership and control of of our forage program since we did that uh, we're not dependent on waiting on a, a custom operator to get here to cut hay or or we have a weather front coming so on and so forth we can adjust the windows and at the end of the day uh the buck stops with us and if we screw it up it's on us and um and so it's it's really allowed us to dial in that window um, of opportunity a lot better uh, obviously that's not a not a cheap uh adventure you know you're you can very quickly have a million dollars wrapped up in equipment to to get the system that you need to make sure you can get the, the feed made in an optimal time. But on the flip side, uh, when you're, when you're harvesting corn silage and you're harvesting, you know, 15,000 tons and you're going to do it in five or six days, uh, that's a pretty, pretty tight window uh, of time and you're going to screw everything up or make everything right for the next 14 or 15 months. And so, uh, you want to be able to make sure you've got the equipment to, to roll when it's time to roll. And, and uh, so, yeah, so that's been a pretty positive thing for us. And uh, on the heifer side, um, we've, we've recently kind of changed around what we're doing with the heifers. Uh, we had in the past up until a year and a half ago, raised all our, our heifers up to about five months of age. 
And then at that point, we're moving them out to custom operators. Uh, last November, we made the decision to farm them out at from birth on. We, uh, we had always been focused on the cows and making sure we were doing everything we could for the cows and the heifer uh, side of things kind of, I wouldn't say got neglected, but we, we didn't pay it as much attention as we should have. And our, we out quickly outgrew our facilities is basically what happened. And so then obviously when you're overcrowded and you are trying to make makeshift facilities work, you know what happens. Um, you know, metabolics go up, uh, performance goes down. And so, uh, we made a decision there last November that we're going to, we're going to try uh, a custom grower that is basically going to take a wet calf at a couple days of age. And we're going to get her home as a bred heifer, you know, anywhere from that hundred to 165 days pregnant and, and see how that works. When I, when I sat down and did the numbers, uh, for us, it, it was pretty, pretty simple, uh, simple uh, answer when I when I sat down and did the numbers and the math that that I, I wasn't sure that we could do it what they were going to charge us for when you actually sit down and figure out all your costs and um, and so the that'll be a t to be determined I guess you might say we'll we'll have to have this conversation again in another year when I get some heifers home and but uh, as far as the benchmark numbers and performance heights and weights that we've seen so far uh, we're right online and um, actually performing a little bit better than what we had been. So I'm I'm optimistic that we're going to see a, a high quality heifer when we come back and uh, be able to, again, like I said in the beginning, focus on the cows and and keep them rolling the way they need to. So, yeah, Scott, kind of while we're talking about cows, what kind of cows do you do you guys have? So the herd is is primarily ho registered Holstein. Uh, Doug and Tom were very proud of their registered Holstein cows that they had in the tie stall barn um, in the late 80s and early 90s, had a tremendous herd of, of registered Holstein cows. And, and we've actually continued that process on. And, and you know, some days I ask myself, is it really worth the couple dollar fee to do the registration and so on and so forth? But um, if nothing else, it's a tribute to, to their legacy and what they've kind of established in the farm. And so we continue to register our Holstein cows and and so, uh, along with that, we, uh, I added a little bit of color to the, to the herd when, when I got involved and, uh, uh, have some jerseys and air shears both in, in our dairy herd. And, you know, it's probably only three, four or 5% of, of the herd is, are the color breed animals. But, uh, the jerseys are, uh, an interesting breed. Uh, those critters are efficient little buggers and, I think uh, there's going to be some opportunity in the future to maybe continue to grow, to grow that breed a little bit in the herd and, um, and maybe continue to focus on this protein fat number that we talked about earlier and, and just see how, see how that plays out. So, so yeah, so that's kind of the way the, the herd sits right now today. So Scott, my understanding is you have some crossbreeding experience in the herd. You want to share your experiences with that? Sure, I can do that. We we went down the crossbreeding road when it kind of was a buzz there several years ago. Uh, played around with the European breeds. Uh, saw some saw some response on the hybrid vigor. I think there was some some definite positives there. Um, Retrospectively, I think we'd have probably been better off if we'd have stayed with more of the traditional dairy breeds on the crosses, and um, but that's not the path we went down. So uh, several years ago, we kind of went back to uh, pure breeding, you know, getting back to purebred Holsteins and uh, keeping the jerseys purebred as well. We have implemented in the last year a uh, pretty aggressive uh, Angus program. And so what we're doing is, is selecting top, the top genetics in the herd, trying to use sex semen on those individuals. And then everything else is, is actually going to a, a beef cross. And so far, I think that's been a, a positive thing for us. Uh, again, time will tell as we get those daughters back into the herd milking again, but um, 
the biggest issue with us was, and, and it's the same everywhere across the country, that trying to get rid of that Holstein bull calf is becoming harder and harder. And, and so we've, uh, we've seen some value in going to the Angus crosses. We've probably put on, well, depending on the time of year, anywhere from $50 to $150 a head above and beyond where we were at with the Holstein calves. So uh, my hope is that that, that continues. Um, we've also played around a little bit. I, I, I'm in the very early stages, but uh, actually uh, implanting beef embryos, purebred Angus beef embryos into some cows, um, just to see if there might even be a little bit more opportunity there uh, to have a purebred Angus calf born. Uh, like I say, we're, we've just completed a round of implantation on those. Um, we'll be checking the first pregnancies actually in a couple of weeks. So time will tell on, on pregnancy rates. And obviously you've got a little more upfront cost with that, uh, doing an embryo versus a traditional AI, but, um, hopefully if, uh, the pregnancies are where they need to be, that we can even gain that little extra cost back knowing that we got a purebred calf coming on the backside. So, um, some yeah, of the stuff you just got to play around with. Yeah. Just a kind of a couple kind of follow-up questions. The, uh, the Angus semen that you're putting on those cows, is that sex semen? Are you looking to get bull calves or does that matter? Second then would be, uh, you know, how are you merchandising or selling those calves? And then lastly, any thoughts about maybe uh, feeding those, those cattle out yourself? Um, all great questions. We, we uh, currently are not using uh, sexed male Angus semen. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around that, and I think there's going to be a time that that is going to be a feasible thing. When we first started this program, I talked with with our semen company, and uh, at that time, conception rate on the male uh, semen straws wasn't nearly as good as what a conventional straw was. So we've we've gone the route of of just using conventional straws and, you know, with the goal of getting a cow pregnant, uh, obviously that's the number one goal. And so uh, we wanted to make sure we got that done and didn't want to sacrifice conception in the process. So currently we're not doing that. Um, maybe as technology improves with the sorting process, uh, maybe that'll be an opportunity for us. So uh, as far as the merchandising goes, we were trying to do some, on-farm merchandising uh, to local growers, local buyers, and uh, found that that to be a little bit difficult and very, very seasonal. Uh, this time of the year, it's really hard to get rid, rid, rid of bull calf or any kind of baby calf for that matter. And so uh, we decided, uh, actually I was approached by our, our heifer grower, our baby calf heifer grower, about the possibility of, of just taking all the calves. And uh, we, uh, we negotiated a price, and um, so currently they're taking everything. And um, we'll reevaluate that in three or four months and see if that uh, was the right move or not and, uh, and see if that will continue. But um, as far as finishing, you know, raising them animals and finishing them out, right now that's that's really not an option for us. I, we don't have the facilities, number one. And number two, uh, I don't have the feed. And so uh, obviously those are two pretty pretty important uh, parts of trying to make that system work because obviously the margins in that are, aren't much better than what our milk and cows. And so um, I, I sure don't like to do things just to do them. So um, that's something we're going to pay attention to and watch, uh, especially if uh, both myself and Nate have – uh, kids and are showing some interest in coming back into the business. And, you know, that might be an option to help, you know, broaden our uh, portfolio a little bit and give the, give the kids an opportunity to get involved back into the, into the farm. So, so we'll see, but uh, for right now, no, we're, we're not doing any, anything like that. So Mike, uh, Scott's such a good guest here. I feel like we're neglecting you just a little bit, but <laughs> why don't we circle back with you and uh, no, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've, we've talked about some, some opportunities here for improving uh, the economics on, on the farm. If, if you were to kind of pick two or three areas to kind of focus on, um, what would those be, Mike, if you were to give some, some advice to, to the listeners out there? 
Well, well, Scott, that's a, a great question. And, and uh, uh, I guess if I could answer that, uh, maybe 24 hours later, I'd even have better answers. But certainly the transition management has to come really to the mind quickly. Uh, I think uh, so many things can go wrong. It sets the lactation curve. It determines pregnancy in some farms, late pregnancies or early pregnancies as far as that goes. So I, I think transition health, transition movement of cows is very key. I'm a big fan of a close-up pen and a fresh cow pen. And I'm not sure, Scott, I won't put you on the spot, but uh, I, I think they see there's so many advantages on a fresh cow pen that we, we think that when people say, well, how many groups are needed on the farm? That's my second group. It's ahead of the heifers. I'm putting the fresh cow group as my, uh, after, if you're a one group TMR, the next group is going to be my fresh cow group as far as that goes. And then I will then take a look at uh, looking at uh, maintaining optimal peak milk and, and components on the herd because as Scott says, that's, that's going to drive the milk check there. So uh, these are not in a rank, uh, rank order. Uh, certainly, uh, Scott, you, 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 you already beat me up a little bit. Uh, got ahead of me. The forage quality is going to be so important. Uh, the the, the low, lower lignin forages look exciting. We're going to see some new corns. They're going to be more drought resistant. So uh, keep your eyes and ears open. There's some new forage crops uh, from the, the fescue grasses are going to get some of the real play in some areas here in the Midwest as well. And then the last thing, Scott, would be the, the heifer enterprise. And we think most of my farmers here in Illinois have 20% more heifers they need. And Wisconsin says it costs $2,200 to raise them and you can maybe sell them for $1,200. So if you only want to lose $1,000, that's a nice way to lose $1,000 for every extra heifer you don't need. So Scott, you, 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 you got it all analyzed at this point. So I'm not sure. Scott, maybe you want to make a comment. What, what are you doing? Do you have a fresh cow group? What kind of groups do you have on your farm with roughly 900 cows? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I would I would completely agree with what you just said on on the fresh cow pen. We we do have a post fresh pen. Ideally, we we leave those cows in there for you know fourteen to twenty days. It's kind of the range that that they're there. Um, some leave sooner, some are there longer, but uh, it definitely gives you an opportunity to put eyes on those cows on a, on a, at least a daily, if not twice a day basis. And I'm not saying you're locking every cow up and doing any kind of a fancy temp check program, but you can put eyes on them and it keeps that cohort group together. They're all kind of going through the same thing at the same time. And uh, it just seems to really, really make the system flow. And so uh, we, three probably you know, it's probably been longer than that four or five years time flies probably been closer to five years ago we uh did a little bit of remodeling in the barn and actually separated the pre-fresh mature cows from the heifers i think that was a positive thing uh if you can do that i would recommend doing that don't sacrifice comfort and stocking densities to do that if you have to do that don't do it at least in my opinion but uh those were two things that that we've we felt it were pretty important. And then after they leave the fresh pen, like you said, Mike, we pretty well do feed a, a one mixed TMR. And we, we put the first lactation animals in, in pens and then mature cows going into different groups. And the goal is that they don't leave that pen until they're, they're pregnant and ready to go dry. So, so yeah. Mike, um, just kind of a follow-up question about 25% of our listeners are actually from Europe and, they uh, the herd sizes are a little smaller there and they have some challenges with with grouping, you know, and just kind of curious if you've got any uh, uh, magic suggestions on how how they, you know, with smaller herds might be able to group their cattle or be able to meet those specific needs of the transition cow. Well, I, I tell you, uh, Scott, you can't do that anymore. But if you're in kind of like a stanchion or, or, or tie stall type barns, boy, can I top dress a two kilo package? If you want to talk European, a two kilogram package that I can top dress to uh, that last uh, two or three weeks before calving. And in the fresh cow pen, uh, the, the same way I, I could do it. So that'd be my first question. What is the housing situation as far as that goes there? Okay, can't do that. So, okay, in Europe, one group dry cows, okay? Put all the dry cows together in one group. Then I'm saying you're going to target the nutrient level for the close-up cows, which means you're going to be running two, two and a half percentage points higher in protein. You're going to be delivering 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. That's going to cost you some money. 
and probably not needed in cows that are, say, 60 days away from calving. But uh, the answer is I don't want to shortchange my cows there. I'm going to have my key additives in there. Some of my rumen protected cholines will be sitting in there. So, uh, again, you may have uh, a, some type of a uh, DCAD balancer in there. Uh, that's 60 cents a day. And so there's going to be uh, uh, two thirds of that pen that doesn't need that 60 cents. But the answer is I want my, I want my close up cows protected as far as that goes. So, and then just what Scott has said here, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you can uh, go to a one group TMR, but he, he is breaking them out by age. Uh, my question for Scott is what about some of these cows? We don't get pregnant on time. Do we have some pretty heavy cows popping up? So that's why we get a little nervous. I'd like to guess maybe five or 10% of my cows, which would be in Scott's situation, maybe be, uh, you know, 80, 90 cows that are in what we call the, 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 the heavy pen. Uh, my stature, we don't call them fat anymore. We call them uh, mature or, 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 or good eaters, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, I relate to that, Mike. I'm not going down that slippery slope. <laughs> well. as that goes. So Scott, I don't know what you want to say about that. Uh, you, you don't have obviously a late lactation group. What do you do with heavy cows? Some farmers said, well, a sucker gets heavy. We, uh, and, and after three straws, she's a no, do not breed anymore. And we just milk her off. And when she's done, uh, she, she finds another career. Yep. And, and Mike, that's, that's exactly what program we've gone to. Uh, we're obviously in a different time than when we were 15 years ago with uh, the help of, of BST. And, and uh, so we've, we've changed our management and um, we've basically drawn the line in the sand. If, if she's had four services or she's greater than 200 days in milk and not pregnant, um, she's just going to milk and, and uh, be a do not read animal for the reasons you, you just mentioned, Scott, that those cows are going to, you know, start pushing high three body condition sores and going to be going dry fours and fives. And uh, that's not a place you want a cow to be at coming back fresh again. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we've decided to do. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's, that's the kind of the path we went down. And uh, obviously you got to have a repro program that's, that's rocking and rolling. Um, and you got to have, uh, make sure you have protocols in place that you don't have cows falling through the cracks because you don't have, you don't have an opportunity for that to try to get her back again. So, but uh, I do have a, a question for Mike. I want to throw back to him on the transition side of things. It's something we actually just uh, uh, are starting this week um, on the kind of going in a little bit different direction with the DCAD, not feeding a DCAD, but feeding a, a zero phosphorus, uh, mineral mix um, started that this morning actually and going to see kind of where that goes I'm, I've just really struggled with what DCAD diets can do from an intake standpoint and I feel like I don't want to do anything to limit the how much feed that pre-fresh cow is going to eat and so we're, we're going to give it a try <laughs> and see what happens just wondered uh, even though we've already headed down the path what's your <laughs> thoughts on that <laughs> Well, I tell you, if, if you, if, if, depending on your politics, I can go one or two ways on this. But uh, anyway, uh, I got to ask you a question. When you say low phosphorus, are you looking at the zeolite products that uh, tie up calcium or are you looking just low phosphorus? Just low phosphorus. Just low phosphorus. We've, we've ah. pulled the phosphorus completely out of the mineral mix and, uh, and we're going to see, see what happens. This, I, I believe Jesse Goff at Iowa State was doing some stuff on that and uh, uh, sounded like was having some pretty good success. And so we'll see. Um, I work pretty closely with our nutritionist and I'm always challenging him on, on pre-fresh things and getting to me, it's always about how much she's eaten. And uh, I'm just not, uh, not convinced that that's the, the DCAT thing is the right way to go. And uh, maybe I'll be, uh, uh, coming back with my tail between my legs in a couple months saying, oh, well, that was a horrible mistake, but um, sometimes that's how you learn. So, Yeah, so I'm going to add three comments, and then you, and then you I'll let you batter back and forth. Number one, if, if, as long as you're going to deliver 40, 50 grams of phosphorus, then you're okay. I would not make them phosphorus deficient. I, 
I, I, uh, Clay, I'm not seeing or Scott, and I'm not seeing any data that says that's that's the way to go. So uh, yeah. go back and, and, and I mean, if you were feeding 60, 70 grams and, and then you took out the dical, the monocal, the monium cal, and you got down to 40, you're, you're probably going to be, be all right. Uh, number two, the uh, popular one in the Midwest is coming from Europe, from the Danes, actually, and that is the zeolites, which makes yep. them calcium deficient. That ties up all yep. the calcium. And uh, Dr. Etzel and I have had some very interesting discussions about that. And uh, uh, that makes me nervous as well, to be real honest. It means you're going to make the cows no calcium for 14 days. So now that she's going to have to mobilize bone for 14 days. And Scott, good luck with that four-year-old, four-lactation Jersey cow that tends to have a little more milk fever prone. I, I'd, be, I'd be nervous about that as well. Then my third comment you aren't going to like, and that is, uh, do you have the right decad? I think there's some newer decads on the marketplace that are acid-based, hydrochloric acid-based, that uh, my understanding do not decrease dry matter intake, but you're spot right. Some of the old decad products, you could lose a, a two, two pounds of dry matter like a dirty shirt. And you're right, that's yep. the last time you and I want to lose two pounds of dry matter at this point. So that'd be my third comment. And so that's probably more yeah. than you wanted to know, but you'll never ask another question. I can see that today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always expect something good from you, Mike. So uh, you're spot on. You're you're uh, you always checking the checking the boxes, and flicking the ears. So I, I was going to circle back to one. It's a little bit. It's a, kind of a, a a change of topics, but you know, I, I grew up in the Star Star Wars era, and so I am always fascinated by the future and what's coming, and so always kind of thinking through those. And and you know, we we're talking about the dry period and how do we meet the certain cows. Uh, specific requirements, which brought on the thought of precision nutrition and the use of technology. And so my question is, being the Star Wars guy, is uh, what's the future look like? Where is technology going? Scott, is that something you guys even think about, right? Whether it's robotics, computer feeders, uh, there's a, a plethora of diagnostics out there that you could employ. Um, and just kind of, do you guys have a crystal ball? Where are we going to be 10, 15 years when it comes to uh, using robotics, technology, artificial intelligence on the dairy farm? Well, for me, I think uh, this this thing is moving really fast. Uh, there's a lot of things continuing to come down the pipe. There's, you know, when you talk, start talking about, uh, you know, the activity systems that are out there that can evaluate rumination and temperature and uh, uh, cow activity, so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to have to make a confession, and, and Mike doesn't even know this yet, but um, last May we uh, we kind of took a step back in time in our milking parlor. Uh, we had uh, about as automated of a system as you could have, uh, had the, a fairly advanced parlor, I guess you would say, even though it was 20 years old. We tried to keep up with the newest and greatest things and we're, we're frustrated to the point where we felt like we needed to do something different in our parlor. And so, uh, last May I completely gutted my parlor, took 100% of the operation out and it's been a, a tremendous, uh, positive thing for us. We've, we've seen a, a significant increase in production, seen a significant increase in efficiency. Uh, our health has improved. So, again, maybe it's back to, like, Mike's comment earlier about not having the right uh, DCAD. Maybe we didn't have the right system. But um, I guess my only my point is uh, just make sure whatever technology you take advantage of is fits your system, fits your, your operation because – if it doesn't, it's a very expensive investment that you're not going to be able to utilize fully. So, um, but yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of stuff on the agronomy side. We're, we're very heavy into GPS and, and uh, grid rate applying fertilizer and, and variable rate, you know, planting seed, things like that um, have been a little bit slower to adapt to some of that stuff on the, on the dairy side. Well, Scott, let me answer. I'll take a swing at your, your question. I think it's a great question. Uh, my comment is, is that we, cows still have a calf. You know? So we still have individual cows that have individual calf. And so some respects, that's the neat thing that, Scott, you could do 20 some years ago. You could manage 82 cows individually as far as that goes. I think we still have to be able to do some of that. And that's why you have such good success with that fresh cow pen. Number two, there's some new technologies now that read the bunks for you. 
So they'll tell you when you run out of feed, where should your feeder be dropping more feed and less feed because cows have different eating patterns. I think that's really neat technology. That technology also can tell you which cows are using which free stalls and why are they not using those 10 free stalls on the west side of the barn or whatever the case is going to be. And then I think we'll have technologies that's going to body condition score for us, Scott. So in other words, uh, every month you're going to get a, a print off the saying uh, your body condition scores are such and such, and you can then put that into automation. So uh, first lactation, second lactation, 100 days of milk, 200 days of milk, 300 days of milk, the body condition score. We'll have technology that'll tell me which cows are lame. And of course, that takes immediate answer. So the question is, if, if all of a sudden uh, the computer says you've got seven cows that are lame scored three, three and a half, four, someone better look at those cows because you've got about uh, a week and they're going to become really lame cows. And then all of a sudden now uh, you, uh, we know the rest of the story from there. So I think these applications and of course the milk itself, just rich in information. Uh, progesterone levels, so we can look at MUN levels, we can look at components as far as that goes, chloride levels, uh, uh, reflecting mastitis, early calls on mastitis. So, gee, Scott, I, uh, the two Scots, we got two Scots here today. I, I, I think uh, it's exciting. And the only problem I have, Scott, you're both younger than I am, so I'm not going to see most of this stuff. But it's, I think it, we're just seeing the, the, the tip of the, uh, of the technology that's going to come to farms as far as that goes. So, so Mike, related to, to feeding economics, so what's your view on, um, on, on feed refusals? What, what, what level of feed refusal should we be feeding? From? Well, let's go back a couple of months when feed prices are fairly economical. They aren't right now. I'm going to be looking at probably about 2 to 4% refusal. If it's over 5%, then Scott's got to feed that to another cow. That's way too valuable to give to older heifers. So we got to feed it. Now that opens up another whole can of worms with health and uh, bunk stability and stuff like that. Today, when feed prices are pretty pricey, one to 2% feed refusal is where I'm going to be at. And I can't have that feed running out much more than about an hour before milking, if that's the next event that's going to happen, or before I drop the next uh, feed in, in front of those cows. A new research study, I think it came out of Canada, they want you to dropping feed in before they go in the parlor. And that doesn't make any sense to me, but their data says those cows will eat, go to the parlor, then they'll come back and eat again. And the bottom line is the suckers ate more dry matter. And I think it's Canadian data. So that, that's kind of cool as far as that goes. Gordy go Jones, some of you will recognize that name. He says, you always got to have 50% of the feed in the bunk. So he says, you know, if, if, if cows at, at night are, are, are eating, uh, let's say it's heat stress time period, but if they eat a lot of feed at night, then you got to make sure you have at least 50% of that feed in there. And we ran across a really good dairyman who went to 10% way back because he said, my good cows will never run out of feed. He took that feed. And he blended it right back into the high group TMR. Now he lived in Maine, so you can probably get away with that. I think in Florida, that might be a little iffy, but so, so in other words, I, I think those are my magic numbers right now, one to 2%. And I, one of my best herds and Scott, you would know who he is. He feeds an empty bunk because he says, by God, if I'm buying that feed, they're going to eat her all as far as that goes. And uh, he's, he's making it work. But uh, you better be really, really sure them buggers don't sort. Because if they sort, some poor devil out there 12 hours after feeding is going to eat something that's not nearly as nutritious as what you and I put together in, in front of those cows. Well, Scott, what kind of, well, what's your situation on feed refusals up there? Well, pretty well, exactly what you just said, Mike. I, we kind of have two separate sets of numbers. Uh, so the main lactating cow groups, we're in that 1% to 2%. That's kind of what we've always targeted on them. But to your point, um, we better be coming with fresh feed no more than an hour after that bunk is either A, empty, or B, cleaned up. Um, and then the other part of it is, uh, our pre-fresh and post-fresh cows, we kind of got a separate set of rules for them. And, and we like to be in that 5 to 6% range on, on those cows. I just, back to what you said earlier, I just don't want those cows out of feed ever. And um, that's a, a fairly small percentage of, of the total feed dropped for the dairy for the day. We can usually uh, take that amount of a refuse and uh, utilize it in the other heifer uh we have some bread heifers on farm that you, we can get that diluted down well enough and still be able to, to get it fed. So we're not having to throw it away. So, but yeah, definitely uh, the, the things change when the, when the numbers move and you're going to continue to dial that in. But 
Um, I, I, we've always felt like we need to keep feet in front of the cows. So, well, Clay, I'm not letting you off the hook. What, what's your numbers? What are you using? Uh, you you visit a lot of farms. So, so I would agree with the one to two percent for you know once you get past the fresh group. I I don't want to limit intake on the in that fresh group right there you know they're coming up on dry matter intake all the time so i i would definitely aim for for a higher level of refus refusals in, in in the fresh group so I, I guess i would add that if, if you if you had a low group scott if you had a low group you might look at a limit feed scenario there in other words trust your computers and say these cows should eat uh 41 pounds of dry matter that's all they're going to get when it's gone it's gone you know and feed to the empty bunk and and say let's uh, let's do that. So uh, there's some beautiful data on the beef area that says if you want to include feed efficiency, you will limit feed. I'm not, uh, but those are beef cows or beef steers rather, and not the high producing dairy cows. So you get those big arguments. Mike, you've brought a great guest with you tonight. Uh, are there any uh, things he's been a wealth of information? Anything, any further mining we can do with Scott uh, that we haven't covered yet? No, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, Scott, are you surprised on anything that we came up in the discussions here? Uh, you, you, uh, do you, uh, I'm just curious. Would you want to tell us what's the situation? Are the two brothers still operating on the farm? Do they own part of the farm, uh, how, or don't you? Can you share any of the how this is being passed along? Well, sure, I'd be glad to. Both are still <laughs> around the day. Um, I'm I'm still uh, keeping Doug busy. He's still kind of taking care of a lot of the books, book work for for us, um, and will probably allow you know, as long as he wants to continue to be involved and do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna let him. And um, um, the other brother Tom is is still around and and is uh, out and about. He he really enjoys the outdoors and spends a lot of time fishing. So uh, when I can pull him away from the, the ice fishing hole or or the boat in the summertime to maybe make a parts run or something for us like that. Why we do that. But, uh, he's kind of enjoying, uh, retirement, I guess you, but, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, like I said at the beginning, it's, it was a process to get the whole thing set up. Obviously, uh, when you start looking at uh, the size of the dairy and then the land base that has to go with it. And of course the machinery, um, it's a pretty, pretty big pill to swallow for uh, a, a couple of young, young up and coming farmers that uh, didn't have a lot behind them. And so uh, I really, I really tip my hat to Doug and Tom and, and what they've done and the time they put in to set the program up for us. And, and uh, obviously they wanted it to work as much as we wanted it to work because if it didn't work for us, it wasn't going to work for them. And, and so, uh, we broke it, we broke down into those separate entities and, um, we've allowed for, for the opportunity to, to, you know, to, if we can be in a position where we can go faster, we'll go faster. But, uh, right now we're just kind of, we've got the plan in place and we're following it and so far so good. So last call, who needs another round? So Steph, we're going to have another round. Uh, so make mine a Buffalo trace this time and make it a double. Uh, so as we kind of get ready to close things out here, tell us a, a, a couple things from both of you that you would recommend, whether it be a nutritionist, maybe even a DVM or dairy farmer, two things that they can implement on their uh, dairy farm pretty quickly here to uh, improve profitability. Scott, I'll let you go first because you're younger. You, you should be able to think oh, fast. Oh, appreciate, appreciate that, Mike. <laughs> appreciate that, Mike. Well, I guess to me, two things that come to mind, and and one is know how to get your numbers and know what that number needs to be. Whether we're like we talked about earlier, uh, making that investment and feeding a, a, an amino acid and what it's going to take to make make that money back, and hopefully have a little profit to show for it. And you know, and you can do that on just about every part of the dairy. Um, the numbers are going to look a little different depending on what inter, you know what part you're you're talking about, but uh, you, you got to know where you're at. And the second part of it is, uh, for us, um, having the resource of a of a qualified individual, whether that's a, a a veterinarian or a nutritionist, that you put your trust in that you sit down, you make a plan, and you know it's going to get followed and and 
have the uh, confidence and the communication that if something's not right or if we're not we're not on on track, hey, how do we get back on track and and get get going forward? And so we we, we depend a lot on our on our outside people, uh, our herd veterinarian and our herd nutritionist uh, are two of the of the most valuable people we have on the dairy team, and and uh, without them we wouldn't have had the year that we've had this past year. So, so make sure you've got the right players on your team, I guess, and then know what, know what your numbers are or know how to get your numbers, I guess was two things I would, I would leave you with. Yeah. Great advice, Mike. Yeah. Basically I'm going to, uh, I'm afraid uh, Scott scooped me again. I, to me, number one, it's, it's data driven. I just have to have data so that we can make uh, informed decisions. That could be milk production, crop production, uh, you, you name it, health decisions, uh, the whole thing. And then number two, look for the opportunities. Where are the opportunities? It looks like Scott, you discovered an opportunity on the bull calves, an opportunity on moving the, the heifers off farm for a period of time. Some may be custom harvesting and uh I think the bottom line is uh, return on investment. Uh, the only reason I think, Scott, you milk cows is that you can take your inputs, your crop inputs, and make some money, turning turning that into money. And we have a small percent of our Illinois dairymen. They should just sell their corn and sell their hay because they make no money putting it through dairy cows. And so I, I think uh, that's a, a key point of, of it's a dairy business. It's no longer just a, a dairy farm, an occupation, but it's a real business. Awesome. Gentlemen, this has been a, a real treat. I've enjoyed it. And so you're welcome anytime to, to, to join us back here at the exchange. Uh, and also like to uh, thank our loyal listeners. Uh, appreciate them stopping by and spending some time with us here again tonight. And uh, if you like what you've heard on the way out, just drop us a five star if you don't mind. Uh, also hit the subscribe button. You'll get uh, alerts to future podcasts. And if you're so inclined, Give us a, a glowing review. It helps us pop up on the, uh, the charts. Um, our scientific conversations, they continue on the Real Science Lecture Series of webinars. Just visit balchemanh.com slash real science to see upcoming events and past topics. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Cheers. Cheers. Mine's empty. Cheers. Stephanie. Cheers. <laughs>